All right, everyone, uh, thank you for tuning in. I'm really pleased to welcome on board Dr. Brett Schoenfeld, uh, whom I wanted to have on for a long time. And if you know who Dr. Schoenfeld is, then you already know that we will cover a lot of cool stuff related to muscle building. So, Dr. Schoenfeld, thank you for taking the time today. It's my pleasure, Eva. Yeah. So, first of all, I'm wondering, uh, have you gotten used to being arguably the leading researcher on muscle hypertrophy and being sort of a revolutionary figure in this regard? Uh, did this sink in completely already? Uh, I don't like to look at it in that context. I just, uh, I, you know, to me, I don't look at myself uh, in, the, in, in the context of other people. I'm just happy to be doing what I'm doing. I'm extremely passionate. I wake up every day jacked to do what I do. And uh, But I will say it's very heartening and really it's extremely self-fulfilling to see that my research and my writings, and not only the research, but the uh, I think importantly, the applications of my research that I discuss have been become very popular, and uh, and that I've helped to promote an evidence-based uh, approach uh, and making kind of simplifying science for the masses and uh, and and making it less mystical. Right. So uh, my first question is uh, related to your research and uh, research hypotheses. So I think I've heard you mention somewhere that your betting average in terms of having hypotheses and then how they will actually pan out is about 50%, right? Yeah, something like that, which is real good for baseball, but not great as a researcher. That's kind of like flipping a coin. Yeah. So uh, what I would be curious is how this plays out for you internally when you you know find something that kind of goes against your initial hypotheses. Uh, do you have a hard time sometimes accepting your own findings? No, not at all. So I think to take a step back, when I publish, when I finish a study, uh, just because I find something doesn't necessarily mean it changed that one study changes my opinion on a topic uh, because each study is just a piece in a puzzle. So, you know, there's been plenty of, of studies. Uh, if you look at the literature, you'll find the results all over the place on many topics. And ultimately, you need to wait until there's enough literature. So I have to look at it in the context of, uh, of the body of literature. But what I'll say is that it not only doesn't it threaten me at all, it, it inspires me. Uh, you know, for me as a scientist, it all comes down to seeking the truth. A, a true scientist it's not about being right or previously being right. It's about getting it right ultimately and, and trying to understand uh, what literature, what, what the research can do to guide your decision making. Because re- the other thing is, is that research is never going to tell you how to train. Re- research provides general guidelines, especially in an, in an applied uh, context when we're looking at things like repetition ranges, volume, frequency. So any of the variables or, or other applied aspects, um, concurrent training, adding in resistance with aerobic training, nutritional uh, guidelines, uh, and nutritional specifics. So we look to re- uh, research to provide guidelines as to to general out- generalities, how to start, you know, kind of giving us a baseline, and then ultimately it comes down to individual prescription from there and figuring things out. So uh, I'm always open to being wrong, and I'm never embarrassed that it's something that I've... Uh, uh, I've thought before has shown to be wrong. I, I mean, I will say I'm embarrassed only in the sense that early on in my career, I was uh, not as scientifically adept. And some of the things that I wrote, I look back on in, in somewhat horror and say, how did I ever think that? But uh, I mean, certainly at this point in my career, I'm constantly re, uh, reevaluating what my thoughts are, my opinions are, and uh, doing that in context with current literature and other uh, other things that I see through through my own practical experience. Absolutely. So one thing I'm wondering is, you know, sometimes when I'm reading a research review or some form of a, a discussion from some of the leaders in the field, there's often a really detailed discussion about how this new finding could impact our practices. And then at the end of the page, the concluding remarks are, well, guys, at the end of the day, this is still nothing revolutionary. So still, if you eat your protein getting your calories and train hard, that's going to give you most of your results. And, you know, even for me, this is kind of disheartening at times, but for you as a leading researcher who is always finding something new that we could discover and potentially that thing could impact how we do things in real life, do you have some similar feelings every once in a while? Well, no, because it really then comes down to what your goals are. So for the average Joe or Jane, the average stockbroker or nutrition or uh, insurance salesperson, 
or, or whoever who's just looking to get some good muscle tone and get stronger and feel healthier, then that's always going to be the case. Then just getting out and doing pretty much something, uh, getting to the gym, lifting some weights, even for a minimal period of time, and uh, even not necessarily all that intensely, and uh, doing some aerobic exercise uh, will get you really what you, the vast majority of gains that you'll, that'll be meaningful to you. But my, uh, my focus, I, I was a former competitive bodybuilder. I've worked with numerous pro professional and uh, very high level amateur bodybuilders, physique athletes, as well as athletes in general. And when you're looking at, at those types of people, or, or even just people who say, Hey, I want to, I'm not going to compete, but I just want to maximize my own genetic uh, potential. Then you need to, to be much more intuitive, much more strategic and, and much more scientific to maximize your, your potential. And uh, certainly at the competitive level, the difference between winning and losing competitions is not, not very much. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't look at it. I, I think that people who, who make those comments are doing so for the general population, which I have no problem with, but you cannot say that on a, that you cannot generalize that to other populations, in particular athletes and, and bodybuilders. All right. So, uh, so let's start with some fundamental things. So if I asked you, say, five to 10 years ago, uh, what the fundamental non-negotiable elements of muscle building are and what you need to get right to build the most amount of muscle possible. Uh, how would you answer that question back in the day? And then how your how would your response differ now if I asked you the same question? Oh, it's just in, in many ways. Now, it's not huge gaping differences, but uh, um, somewhat, I don't even say this other way. I mean, some of them are. So, First and foremost, uh, the repetition range. I was a staunch believer that there was a hypertrophy range of six to 12 reps or so, and that uh, training within that range for various reasons would maximize hypertrophy through the work of my lab and others. And I think the evidence on this is now compelling. Uh, we're showing that you can gain muscle across a very broad spectrum of repetition ranges. So uh, there is no hypertrophy range, and that from a, on a general level, allows the average gym goer huge latitude in the uh, repetitions that they can do, the loading uh, strategies that they can use. And I will say what remains to be determined in, in our lab, I'm currently uh, in collaboration with an, another very prominent lab looking to carry out research to see whether there might be specific fiber type effects, type one versus type two, uh, within the uh, high versus low load uh, paradigms. So anyway, that certainly is one. Um, I had believed that uh, short rest intervals because of uh, enhanced metabolic stress and potentially hormone, uh, acute hormonal responses, which actually that in itself has been shown to play a very little role where I thought it played a bigger role. But uh, that short, uh, short rest intervals was a beneficial strategy for muscle growth. My own uh, lab, as well as others, have shown that not to be the case. And it now seems that, <clears throat> at least for um, for multi joint movements, two minutes or so uh, would seem to be more preferable to maximize the hypertrophic response. Um, I used to believe that bro splits were the best way to uh, bring about muscle growth. I'm no longer in that camp. Uh, that's kind of a long road to go down, but. From really all the evidence, and there's just been a ton of it recently, frequency by itself doesn't seem to have a major effect. And uh, there does seem to be a benefit to spreading out with somewhat higher volumes. Once uh, volume starts to reach a critical threshold of about probably 8 to 10 sets per session, uh, any more than that seems to be beneficial to spread out that volume over at least two days. And there might be a slight benefit uh, to training muscles anyway, two days a week, but even that is somewhat equivocal. So, I mean, these are just some of them and I, I can go through really a lot of it is in the nuances of what of, uh, just becoming a much better scientist and a practitioner, combination scientist, practitioner, and understanding the nuances of the, uh, topics where I before was much more hardened to certain opinions. Uh, I think one thing that immersing yourself in research and carrying out a lot of research shows you is just how how much number one people respond differently individually and that uh, research really just 
provides general guidelines to these things and how important it is to start to understand when you're, you're working with individuals, their individual response, not only through genetic factors, but also various lifestyle factors. So it's a, uh, science is a very nuanced, applied science is a very nuanced topic and entity and uh, needs to be considered as such. Right. So, you know, these days, uh, one of the favorite questions of uh, people who run fitness re related podcasts uh, when they interview an expert on training is to ask what someone thinks about the recent Schoenfeld study. So I'm assuming you know which study I'm referring to, which is your recent study on training volume. But it's really cool to be able to ask you uh, who conducted the actual study uh, the same question. So first of all, could you briefly outline what we should know about your study? And then what are, what are your thoughts about it now, looking back, you know, after receiving some interesting criticism, some pretty emotional feedback? Uh, how do you think about uh, your own study? Well, I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure what you mean is specifically there, but the study basically showed that uh, from a hypertrophy standpoint, that there was a dose response relationship uh, for volume and that from interestingly from a strength standpoint there wasn't that uh, uh, at least in the context of what we did there was really no difference in terms of their 1RMs. Um, from the hypertrophy standpoint uh, we showed that there was a graded dose response uh, between the various volumes that occurred and I, I think uh, some people have overinterpreted it because when you say we were looking to find the upper regions it wasn't <laughs> The study actually had somewhat of a moderate overall volume. We did seven exercises per workout, and uh, one group did one set, the other did three, and the other did five. So the most, the highest volume only did, I want to say only, it was 100 sets total per week for the entire body, which by bodybuilding standards is moderate to even somewhat low for a lot of bodybuilders. Uh, and the study lasted eight weeks. So what has to be appreciated is that uh, this doesn't, that number of sets for every muscle group. It was a very limited study. And I think what we showed quite nicely, or what this study showed was that uh, that volume is a primary driver and that it supports the literature. Um, I, I think that uh, we modeled this study based on a previous uh, study by Radielli, a group in Brazil, by a group from Sao Paulo. And uh, they found actually much greater um, hypertrophic responses for the highest volume group. We, at least they, they only did the upper body, but their uh, their upper body responses were much greater than ours. And there's a lot of reasons why uh, that can be taken into account. And I think uh, one of the most, the biggest take homes here is that uh, uh, for some people responded very well. If you look at the, again, the individual responses to the lower volumes, but I think on the overall basis that especially for hard gainers for a given muscle group it may be beneficial to use higher volumes and certainly that uh, for shorter periods of time I, I think that if we had have carried this out over longer periods of time there would have been a plateau and even negative consequences potentially from uh, from too much but even then because the overall volume in the study was fairly modest uh, it's difficult to know so I, I don't I think that some of the people who took it that there was some controversy here were uh, off base. I don't see it personally, but that's uh, the one thing when we carry out studies, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Yeah. And uh, just to set the tone for my upcoming questions, I'm really looking forward to see uh, further research on this. I think your study was very interesting and I do not suspect data frauding or anything like that. Uh, and to be honest, I'm not even clear on why you would want to fraud the data in the first place. I mean, people talk about being sponsored by big pharma with certain studies, but in this case, I mean, who would you be sponsored by? Like big volume or, or what? It's just silliness. So, you know, I, I wouldn't even address something like that. It's just silliness. But uh, but again, it's one study, as I said before, and um, you have to look at it in the context of, of the body of literature. Uh, certainly, I don't program, uh, if it really hasn't changed my overall programming context, uh, except for perhaps using it as a, um, a specific strategy for a given muscle group to bring up a given muscle group in someone who is not a good responder with that muscle group. But other than that, uh, you know, it, it's one study that uh, had a limit. Uh, certainly, if all the muscle groups had that type of volume, so if you're doing, let's say, 300, 250 or 300 sets, which it would have taken to do, per week to uh, to train all the muscle groups with that type of volume, 
I would have expected a different response. So um, again, you have to, uh, it's one of the problems when you're carrying out research and some people who aren't researchers try to uh, analyze studies. They just don't understand how to, uh, con- the essence of context. Right. Uh, so some things are valuable to discuss here, nevertheless, I think. So first of all, uh, when you look at this study and the Red Alias study that you just mentioned, what do you think are some real life uh, applications that we could draw uh, from this study? Well, I kind of covered them. And I will say for me personally, I still, that my recommendations have been and kind of still are until, until I'm convinced otherwise that somewhere in that 10 to 20, maybe 10, 25 uh, sets per muscle per week is a general guideline that I use. And I would generally not go into the upper regions for more than a fairly short period of time. But I, one thing that I'm at least uh, trying to do, or at least uh, I'm implementing on a limited scale, is utilizing, like I said, for specific hard to bring up muscle groups, somewhat higher volumes for a given muscle group for short periods of time. So kind of specialized muscle group training. I think that's more what the study gives some insights into. Uh, but on an overall basis, like I said, you have to, volume to me, and this is just a, such a really important point that for some reason a lot of people seem to gloss over. You have to look at the context of the total number of sets per the entire body per week. So overtraining is generally the overtraining response to a given muscle group. I'm not even convinced that's that's a thing. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe it could be. It, it certainly it hasn't been documented in the literature. But overtraining is a systemic response from too much training on an overall basis. So... If you do, if you're just training your legs and you do, let's say, 50 sets per week and don't do anything else for the upper body or any other muscle groups, uh, that's a fairly low volume. And I, I don't think you could probably deal with that for a long period of time, depending upon what else you're doing. So uh, it really you have to look at volume in an overall context. I think that another thing this brings about is the potential for having greater volumes for certain lagging muscle groups and then less for others. So that, again, the overall volume per, per week is somewhere in a uh, manageable range. And you have to look at, there's so many factors that go into that. So our study, as well as the Radiello study, used young males uh, who have, I think the average age in our study was like 20, 21 years old. So their recovery is generally gonna be a lot better than someone in their 40s. And uh, that needs to be taken into account. And, um, you know, stressors, your own uh, individual stressors, nutrition, many factors, these again are just providing guidelines. And I, I don't think the, uh, even both of the studies together, now they, they certainly are interesting, but our study and Radiella has used fairly moderate volumes over the course of the study. The difference with Radiella, which is somewhat interesting, is their study was carried out over a six month period, um, which is a, quite a long time and uh, that, they did not not only not show any negative effects for the highest volume group, but they by far exceeded the other uh, groups, which was really interesting. And by the way, that was the reason that we wanted to carry out the study to, to see it's basically a replication study to see uh, kind of proof of principle. But um, I, I would also say with that, their their subjects were uh, military personnel, so perhaps their military personnel is uh, I'm sure you know. Uh, they're trained to endure a lot more than the average person is. So that's why trying to generalize, when you're looking to generalize results, that always needs to be taken with uh, circumspection. Right. So uh, I'd like to pick apart a few things you said here. So the first thing is something you just mentioned, which is that the results might have been different had the study uh ran longer, and especially if they had trained more muscle groups with the same volume. And so why do you think that is? Because uh, one could argue that muscle growth and muscle recovery is is largely a, a local process. So should it really matter in theory for your quad recovery, how much you train your rear deltoids, for example? Systemic. I mean, so it's a systemic response. And, and I'm just speculating because it's not been done. I, I would think if you're doing 250 to 300 sets for your whole body per week, uh, now, in fairness, Arnold used to train that way around the clock, but I think there were some pharmacological benefits that he uh, he enjoyed that might have altered, 
you know, had, had an effect on that. But in the overall context, it's a systemic response. When you're doing a lot of exercise, it's draining. It's, it's a, it's both, um, it's physically taxing, neuro, neurologically taxing, neuromuscularly taxing to the whole uh, system and, and perhaps somewhat psychologically as well. So, um, volume, high, very high volumes. Now that's been more studied on an aerobic level, but that's where overtraining has its highest uh, response. Now, I'd also say too, that you have to look at the repetition range that we use was a moderate rep range. Um, the one time that I really, in the studies that I've done, that I really saw a marked um, overtraining where I, I could see that the, when I say see, it was evident that the uh, subjects were getting into an overtrained state was a study I did that compared to powerlifting routine versus a bodybuilding routine. And we did three sets of 10 versus seven sets of three. So the seven sets of three uh, was three times a week. And it was, um, so it was 20, let's see, it was uh, seven sets of three for three exercises. So it was 21 sets, really not that big a volume, but it was with three reps to failure and they were trashed. So when you're using heavy loads with higher volumes, because high volume and low volume are somewhat ambiguous. But uh, that's where when, when the loading was very heavy, uh, that's where the joint issues came in and um, just they seem neuromuscularly and, and mentally taxed from training with high volumes and uh, and heavy loads. And they were uh, they were just beat up. They were telling me they, they needed a break. I did an exit interview with them. They needed, uh, they, they wanted to have a, not only a deload, an active recovery week. Uh, a couple of them had to drop out because of injury. Uh, they were complaining of back soreness. Uh, anyway, it was uh, very telling that uh, combining very heavy loading with high volumes is just not a, a good strategy. Yeah, and, and touching on the duration of the study a bit, so what would you actually expect uh, to happen if the study ran for much longer, say for six months? Yeah, so, so again, in the context of the overall, certainly if it's one muscle group, it's hard to know. Uh, I don't know what the, it's kind of very speculative. And, and by the way, I don't know that they weren't actually experiencing some degree of overtraining because we didn't do midpoint testing. So it, it could be that they might have had better results if we looked at them at the four week standpoint and maybe their results actually dwindle. I, I don't know. Those are things, unless I had done testing at uh, the end of the fourth week, let's say at the midpoint, we, we could have gotten a better indication as to whether they were still growing or maybe they plateaued or maybe even they were regressing. So it would be purely speculative uh, to try to say what would happen. Uh, I do think just from my, the study can't tell me, but just from my own, uh, what I, I, I've trained a lot of very high level bodybuilders and physique athletes and, and, and natties uh, as specifically as well. I mean, pharmacologically advanced, but natties. And I will say that uh, over time, uh, high volumes, very high volumes do not work well because of the uh, overtraining response that I've seen that uh, on an individual level. Now, that's different for all people. Some people seem to be able to go longer than others. And that's just uh, that's the natural variation with with human human beings. So I, those are all questions that uh, it's very difficult for me to speculate. I, if you're asking me to speculate, I told you my batting average with speculation and research hypotheses, but I would speculate that if the study had ran longer, that probably we would have seen plateaus or negative consequences. Um, but that's pure speculation. And that wasn't what was shown in the Radiello study, like I said, although they didn't do midpoint testing either. So it's hard to know how that point, uh, played out as well. Yeah. Uh, do you actually plan on doing a study on even higher volumes, like, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 sets or something? Uh, I don't, is that, is that in my plans now? No. Um, I, I just don't think that's practical as well. Um, you're not going to have people in the gym for, you know, I'd have to do like one muscle group. It's just, it's not, a, you have to look at the practicality of the research as well. So how practical is that for the average person? Are, are they going to be in the gym four hours? No. So uh, even if there was been, I it just, I, I probably wouldn't, I never rule anything out, but I have so many, I think more uh, important studies. Uh, I, it's kind of funny too because I didn't <laughs> expect that was a study that James Krieger was the one that um, had been bugging me to. When I say bugging me, we've been talking about it and saying, "Hey, we really should do this replication study," and it'd been down on my list. And uh, finally, I uh, I was able to fit it in, but uh, it wasn't really a pressing study that I've been looking to do. So uh, there's just so many cool topics out there. Uh, so. I don't know. I, I'll 
I always take, uh, I have a, like a one year plan at this point and I have so many other studies that uh, they're on the back burner that uh, we'll see. I, certainly if I get a student that comes in that's dying to do a volume study, I'm always open to, to explore. Yeah, uh, we will get into some other stuff, uh, as I'm sure you're a bit sick of talking about this uh, volume thing, but I just need to scan this in a little further. Uh, so uh, one criticism that the study received was that perhaps a lot of the muscle growth that was observed by was uh, confounded by temporary swelling. And you dispel this notion quite well in some follow up writings. But could you just elaborate on this on this podcast as well? Like why are these criticisms not valid in your view? Yeah, I just don't think it's. I, I can't rule that out, but I think that it's a it's a it's a reach because uh, they were trained subjects that we know that they did the exact same routine over and over again, and that the uh, really swelling the only mechanisms I know that would cause that would be muscle damage, and uh, you're not going to get substantial muscle damage uh, doing the same routine over and over. There's something called the repeated bout effect that over the course of eight weeks, uh, generally over the course of a few weeks, we have I have a paper coming out that I've collaborated with another group that just your, the swelling effect goes down uh, substantially to, to almost nothing after, and 48 hours later, after a uh, recent studies from uh, Stu Phillips lab have shown this, that after 48 hours, uh, there's really no effects of, uh, of muscle damage. So I just, I think that it's, it's a big reach. So people could say that if, and everyone's well, uh, entitled to make speculations. You just shouldn't do that because you have a preconceived bias. If that's something you, you feel, I encourage other people should replicate the study that, you know, have outside labs. That's always the best practice with uh, research is to have replication studies. And uh, we, we did that with the, uh, the Radietti study. Now, obviously, populations are different. There's always going to be certain differences. But uh, I, I don't think the, uh, the swelling is a, a factor. Yeah. Um, on the methodologies for a second, uh, as far as I know, you reduced the weight between sets to keep the, the participants in the same rep range. Uh, is that correct? That's correct. And, and would you know uh, by what percentage the weight had to be reduced across all sets, like between the first set and the fifth set, for instance? No, I, I don't remember. And uh, I mean, I, I don't carry out the training myself. My research assistants do. So I, I don't remember. I certainly have that data, but I, I didn't look through that. That wasn't something that I examined. Um, I, you know, again, it's just not. <clears throat> that's just a, a uh, an artifact of what of the routines. So you have to look at could you have done things differently, and that would have had different results. Could I have taken longer rest? Yeah, that would that have uh, had effects. We we just we carry out a study. Uh, we try to uh, decide at the beginning of the study what would be the best. Uh, protocol to answer our question and and also have the most practical relevance number one just for in terms of us carrying out the study but also in terms of it being carried out in uh, in practice in in the general public so I don't recall I, I mean I think look at it and I don't recall that even being mentioned yeah, sure. And I didn't address this as a criticism. But the reason why this is interesting for me is because we talk a lot these days about uh, junk volume and that beyond a certain point, it's better to just not perform more work if you're acutely so fatigued that you can only train at a fraction of the intensity that you could otherwise train at. And, you know, a lot of the arguments against bro splits are predicated on this. And in my mind, if I think about doing five sets of squats with short rest periods, I would intuitively think that by the fifth set, you will have to use such like baby weights because of the temporary fatigue that it will be the classic case of junk volume. Um, but you know, like this study kind of refutes this notion in some ways. And maybe volume is just such a powerful stimulator of muscle growth that as long as you soak your muscles into tons of tension, a lot of the things such as uh, splitting your workouts up into uh, different days to have high quality workouts or having sufficiently long rest periods might kind of become moot points. Uh, like, do you see where I'm going with this? No, I, I would disagree with your comment because you just said it's qualitative. Um, you said that uh, it reduces the quality. It doesn't reduce the quality, it reduces the volume. The reason that, um, at least the theorized reason why the shorter rest has negative effects is because it has negative effects on volume. One thing I do know is that the volume load was much greater, volume and volume load was much greater in the 
in each bump up from the three to the one and the five to the three. So there's more volume. Now, maybe it wouldn't have been, you would have had even more differences in volume load uh, had, uh, let's say, longer rest intervals been taken. But qualitatively, if you're looking at it, I, when I say, when I think of qualitative, it has to do with the kinematics, how people carry out the, the form. And uh, that was, there was no qualitative. I don't think the quality of the sets was reduced. I think just the volume, the volume load would have been higher had we, uh, let's say, done had longer rest intervals. But of course, that increases the time uh, that it takes to carry out the study, which it was just extremely difficult. It was a very difficult study to carry out. This took a year, a year of my life away. So, uh, and and we have to be able to get all the subjects in and be able to, you know, train them effectively. So anyway, I, I think that it more certainly the working theory or the working. I would call it even a theory at this point, is the reason that the shorter rest has negative impacts is because it impacts volume load, which is a volume quantity. Again, you're kind of being redundant. Yeah, and I agree completely that it would have been even more effective with longer rest periods. But um, where, I, where I was getting at is that if I looked at this design from the outset, I would have predicted that, well, with this much volume and with these short rest periods, they will be just performing a ton of junk volume because by the end of it, they will just use baby weights compared to what they could if they rested longer. So, you know, don't even bother trying a training protocol like this. Again, I, I can't, uh, when, when we're looking mechanistically, we didn't study that, but when you're saying baby weights, uh, we just talked earlier that uh, the heaviness of the load, provided that you're training the failure, has been shown quite conclusively not to matter much. Uh, so again, it really seems to be that the muscle is stimulated through uh, being pushed and it's hard for me to you know know mechanistically what's going on those are questions that would have needed specific uh, study but then we didn't do that so yeah th those are all questions that uh, really uh, need to we, we certainly are far from understanding mechanistically what's going on we actually uh, I collaborated on a recent paper that was published in journal of applied physiology uh, that you might want to take a look at where we discuss mechanisms, but more importantly, discuss how far we still are away from understanding the true stimuli, the drivers of, uh, of hypertrophy. And do you think that that might be the reason why training frequency seems to not matter as much according to some recent research? Because having higher quality workouts and being able to perform with higher weights in uh, a more recovered fashion might not be as important for hypertrophy as just simply for performing challenging sets and pushing the muscles close to fatigue with enough volume. So you know what I mean, right? So if you do a bro split, it might not matter that you will perform a lot of work in a, an acutely fatigued state because a challenging set of 10 is a challenging set of 10 irrespective of the absolute intensity? I think that on, uh, to some extent that probably is the case. As I mentioned earlier, I do think the, because there's always an interaction amongst variables. And I think um, at least my working hypothesis at this point is that where the frequency, and so we show that on a volume equated basis that, that really the frequency is not a dry, it really doesn't matter. It's not, has very little relevance. But uh, when uh, there's limited evidence on this, and this is actually an area that I'd like to study more and, and will, uh, so I have plans, but uh, looking at using frequency to um, meet higher volumes, using it, having the, vi the interaction between volume and frequency and how that interacts and, and potentially mediates greater effects. And my theory is, is that when you get above a certain volume, uh, then it might be beneficial for to, for spreading out that volume. Awesome. So uh, yeah, then let's uh, touch on some of the things that excite you at the moment. So you just mentioned that there are a lot of things that still interest you in the field of hypertrophy. Uh, would you care to give some examples as to what those are? Well, one of them I mentioned earlier is, is the um, effects on uh, type 1 versus type 2 fibers. I, I think that to me is a very exciting area of research and looking at the uh, potential fiber type specific responses to different training protocols. Um, it just has a lot of, uh, I think, cool potential inferences. And in a similar vein, um, potentially uh, training muscle groups based on their fiber type, uh, which kind of takes it from a different 
quality. We have a study that should be starting shortly that's going to do that. Um, I'm currently, uh, well, in the middle of a study, uh, which is going to be finishing up next semester, that looks at uh, integrating posing, or basically isometric holds, within the uh, rest interval of workouts. So how, using the rest intervals, there's another uh, area that I'd like to explore too that I don't want to kind of give away, but this one is looking at potentially doing uh, isometric holds, which basically amounts to bodybuilding posing for given muscle groups in the interset rest period and seeing how if keeping the work at the exact same time might impact growth in that respect. And um, we're just finishing up testing on the first cohort now. So that'll be, a, I think, a cool study. Um, it's just so many. Uh, there's um, some nutrition studies that I want to do with protein timing, uh, which I think are really needed to get better insights uh, from distribution standpoint, daily distribution of protein timing on muscle growth. Those are kind of some of the ones I I can recall off the top of my head, but I have a I keep a running log of these things and uh, kind of check them off and revisit and talk to my students uh, as to what maybe we can work on next. That's a high priority. Yeah. Uh, what is your current hypothesis on the fiber type uh, targeted training? Like, do you think that? high rep, low load work might target slow twitch fiber growth more? Or do you think that ultimately it's just the last few reps that matter in any given set anyway, and those are going to recruit most of the muscle fibers anyway, and, and that's what matters? So what, what do you think? Well, correct. That's the, that's the conundrum. So it's really hypothesis at this point. I just uh, co-authored a paper with my colleague, uh, Chozo Gurdjik. Uh, uh, we published it in Frontiers uh, earlier this year. Where we went through the literature, and there, uh, there is some literature. Now, it's certainly not compelling, uh, and certainly there's, it's highly equivocal the body of literature itself. But uh, there is some literature that does show uh, a preferential effect, and uh, there's a good logical basis for it as well. Given that, um, and there was also, by the way, a, uh, a recent uh, EMG study that looked at. Now, this was a more involved, not just your basic um, uh, surface EMG. They actually looked at the recruitment thresholds of each motor unit. So it was a really nicely done study. And uh, they showed that the uh, heavy loads recruited more higher threshold motor units. And if that's the case, and there is, um, that's not just about recruitment anyway, but certainly if it's not recruited, you're not going to get hypertrophy of those fibers. So if that is the case and you're getting equal hypertrophy, well, something has to give. You have to be getting more hypertrophy somewhere if you're getting less total recruitment, unless somehow those recruited uh, motor units are not hypertrophying in the heavier loads. So uh, if you're asking me what my, uh, my own belief is, my own at least uh, research hypothesis at this point, I would say there are might be, uh, I, I think there is at least the possibility that uh, the lower load training, because it's keeping the more muscle, the endurance oriented type one fibers under uh, load, under tension for longer periods of time, might bring about greater hypertrophy of those fibers where the heavier loads might stimulate the higher threshold motor units, which are the, associated with the type two fibers. I think that if that is the case, that we're not talking big differences, but for a bodybuilder, could that make a difference? Yeah. So if the average person, if you're asking me again, this is where context comes in, would that have any real relevance to your average gym goer? No, I don't think so. Uh, could it have relevance to your athlete or bodybuilder? Potentially. And uh, that's why we have to carry out the study to see. And how do you think uh, that this might manifest over time for a bodybuilder, for example? Like, do you think if there is differentiated growth in the different muscle fibers with heavy or light training, but someone always trained in the, like, I don't know, 12 to 15 rep range. Like, do you think that a person like that would build several pounds less muscle over the course of a, a training career? Or like, how do you think this would manifest itself? No, I think it's the former. I think it gives credence. And by the way, without knowing, given that there is a potential benefit to it and no detriment that I can see. Certainly that is my current strategy when I'm working with uh, elite physique and bodybuilding athletes to train through a spectrum of rep ranges uh, specifically for that purpose. But yeah, I think that that would give more credence to training um, 
specifically with a combination of higher and lower reps. Uh, by the way, there also is recent evidence. Uh, a colleague of mine just published a study with in uh, elite weightlifters <clears throat> uh, that he incorporated uh, two blocks of of blood flow, very light blood flow restriction training, and they found substantially higher, but about seven percent versus no growth in the uh, other group. Seven percent increases in type one fiber hypertrophy in this group, and they have another paper coming out which they've told me about. I don't believe it's published yet, but in your average trainees, that also again shows that blood flow restriction training with light loads uh, showed preferential development of type one muscle fibers. So there is, again, the theory that training with light loads to failure has similar effects as training with blood flow restriction with light loads. You just having, you have to perform more reps with the light loads without the blood flow restriction. But that at least, again, just looking, that's when you're a scientist, you try to look at what the evidence shows uh, to make a case why something might work. And then, then ultimately it comes to putting that to the test. So we'll see. Yeah, uh, one thing that I wanted to ask earlier, but I, I just forgot that, do you uh, think that there might be some more novel and precise ways of quantifying training volume that we might be able to use over time? So there's this concept that basically every set has five effective reps, and those are the reps that are uh, taking one close to failure. Maybe you saw uh, Chris Beardsley's graph um, that he put out on this one. Do you think that maybe one day we will be able to have a much more precise way of thinking about volume and maybe just thinking about hard sets is a very blunt tool and it's almost like thinking about protein intake in terms of ounces of consumed meat as opposed to grams of protein and over time we will have a um, much more precise way of quantifying training variables as well? Uh, I think that, yeah, I think science keeps progressing forward and I think we'll... Um... I think over the next five to 10 years, we're going to be way ahead in our knowledge than where we are now. And I think that even more importantly, I think that we're going to be able to genetically um, do genetic, easy genetic tests, probably through saliva, that will be able to tell you what might be the best nutritional protocol and to some extent exercise protocols. Um, I think that we're still a long way off from getting that to where it's going to be highly practical. And I think even when you can do that, I think you have to keep, uh, it's going to be more complex than, than that. But uh, I think that'll give, you, give us a much greater ability to hone in, but I don't think that's going to be the be all end all. You're not going to get the perfect program. I, I don't think, I don't see how that can happen, but uh, I think certainly it will help us. So yeah, I think that science, uh, it's amazing what we're learning. I think over the past, decade, we probably have learned more about um, many things than we knew in the past 50 plus years, certainly resistance training wise. Um, look, over the past I think, two years, we have doubled the number of studies on frequency that we had. And we have, I think there was once we did our first main analysis in 2015, I believe it was on frequency. I think it was 15, either 15 or maybe even 16. And in the past like two or three years, there's been like eight studies in resistance strain subjects that have come down. I have a couple more that are in review or I'm collaborating on a couple more that we currently have in review. So uh, the breadth of, of research that's coming out is, is staggering. And um, I think that the, it's exciting to think about what's going to happen over the next, next decade. Great. Well, Dr. Schoenfeld, uh, I think I asked you all my questions. So is there something I definitely should have asked you and I didn't ask? Uh, no, it's, we're very thorough. And certainly there's so many topics uh, that uh, you know, when I talk, I can go on for days. But yeah, I mean, we covered, uh, I, I think, certainly a good breath and hopefully uh, it was educational for the people that will be listening. Awesome. Well, um, thank you so much for dropping all this great knowledge. Um, so yeah, please just let people know where they can find more out about you and your work and just plug any resources that you would like people to check out. Yeah, they can, I, I mean, I, I have my own website. They can, I'm all over social media. If you just Google me, you'll find me. And uh, I provide a lot of, most of the content that I'm providing is free. So I, I don't, I really don't have products that I'm, you know, I do have books that are available. They can go on amazon.com. I have a textbook. I have some consumer books that are available, but uh, I post a lot as my, my blog. I'm, not as prolific as I should be, just so many things going on. But I post, I've um, been more focused on Instagram lately, 
uh, just as better interactions. But I'm all over uh, Twitter and, and Facebook as well. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Schoenfeld, thank you so much for taking the time today. It was an app. My pleasure. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode and liked what you heard. And if you did, then I think you definitely love our SSD training and nutritional course that we recently put out with Birgia Fuggerly. This program not only contains a 12-week phasic training program that you can use to time efficiently and safely build the best body you can, but also gives you four plus hours of video lectures about managing your nutrition and lifestyle to not only look good, but feel and perform optimally. So if this sounds interesting to you, then go ahead and check out sustainableselfdevelopment.com. And of course, to not miss out on future episodes like this, subscribe to the podcast and you'll be up to date on everything we'll be putting out. So thank you for hanging around up until now and see you next time.